Today on Time Out Coaching, we have a legend of British basketball and now tra trailblazing at the highest levels of NCAA basketball. Currently the assistant coach at Montana State University. I'd like to welcome Coach Chris Haslam. Coach. Great to be here, Tony. Great to see you again. Been excited yeah. about this for the last few weeks when uh, you, you first reached out to me. So uh, uh, like that's I said, great. I know we haven't thought, been face to face, but yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks. Well, I mean, the interesting thing about you is you you had, uh, you know, a really high level playing career. And what I'm most interested in is to, you know, talk about right at the start and then going through the, the pro career as quickly as possible. But some of the coaches you played for, you know, these are, you know, really, really high level. Um, so let's start right at the start. Uh, you know, how did you get involved in basketball? and those coaches that were, you know, some of your earliest influences. Yeah, I mean, I, it was very lucky, you know, my, my beginning in the game. Obviously, I'm from Southport in the Northwest. And, you know, obviously, like every other English kid, you know, it was football, it was cricket, it was rugby in school. And I got lucky that we had a PE teacher at my high school, Berkeley High School in Southport, who, had, you know, was playing some local league basketball in the kind of Northwest. And we started doing basketball and PE classes. And, and this was when I was going into my last year at high school. So I was 16, you know, I was six, eight, six, nine at that time. And uh, started to literally just play in PE class. And we obviously with my height was, a, was immediately, you know, kind of fell in love with the game. So from that, you know, um, in Southport, there, there was a kind of local basketball program at the local Southport YMCA. And on Sunday mornings, they had some junior coaching. So I started to go down there a couple of hours every Sunday. And, you know, actually pretty decent coaching looking back, you know, pretty decent uh, for that, you know, that time and, and, and that level. And then after a you know, couple of months of, of, of playing there and, and, and really becoming, hey, this is for me. I really want to, you know, play and, you know, develop and, and, and really do something with it. I started then training and going to the evening practices and on Sunday with like the, the men, the senior players and started playing kind of local Northwest league basketball for the, for the, you know, Southport YMCA South team, South. <laughs> which is, which, I mean, it was a pretty good, you know, local league and all sure, that. And then sure. from there, I don't, again, it was, it all happened pretty quickly, you know, two, three months down the line of that, that kind of season, and I, I can't remember the guy's name, but we were playing a, like a, a, a local game and a guy came up to me after the game and said, hey, would you be interested coming down to Chester Jets? You know, because obviously, you, you know, it's about 50 minute drive from Southport and come in practicing. And he told me about Joe Forber, Mike Burton, and it was like the under 23s at that time. So I ended up going to Chester Jets to practice twice a week there. And, you know, obviously uh, with, with Joe, obviously, you know, a legend in, in youth basketball in England. Yeah. And from that point, you know, it, that was great, you know, playing at a higher le level there and, and, and those practices. And it came back when I was still practicing at the YMCA in Southport, there was an American guy who through his work ended up living in Southport who played at Purdue University in like the early eighties, really good player, Bruce Parkinson got drafted. Right. And, you know, this is probably four months since I really started playing, five months. Yeah. He was like, have you ever thought about going to the States? Well, no, I, I had no idea. High school basketball in the States, college basketball, no idea. And originally I was going to try to go uh, and live with him back in Indiana, which is, you know, where he's from in Kokomo, Indiana, go to high school where his sons went and play. And he was like, you'll get recruited and see what happens. But the high school rules didn't allow it was weird you know transfers coming in from inter, you know international kids it was weird but I'd kind of started talking to Joe and Mike about it about the you know coming to the states and they had a contact in Savannah Georgia who contacted the high school where I eventually went that conversation started you know taking place so literally 10 months later 11 months wow. later I'm in Savannah Georgia and I'm at high school as a transfer student and I'm playing and it worked at, out well there. At that stage, you know, you do. Did you have a kind of a reference of how good Joe and Mike were as 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 coaches? You know, and some of the things that they were already installing in you. 
like obviously it, with the under 23 practices, I was getting, you know, it was, I was mainly getting obviously coached by Joe. Mike was there and he'd come down, but obviously he was with the, you know, the, the BBL team. Sure. Uh, but Joe was really good. You know, yeah. obviously his discipline, you know, how hard, again, the intensity of practices, very, you know, uh, big on fundamentals. You know, I remember the footwork pass it just very fundamentally sound drills. And, and, and I think it gave me a good base. Yeah. But the one thing I do remember is how hard practices were, how intense. And I think that set me up of, okay, this is the level that you have to work to, you know, have a chance in this game. And I think that held me in good stead when I first went to the States. Yeah. Um, I went to a smaller high school, which was, I think, the best thing for me. I think if I'd have gone to a big, you know, 5A big classification high school in, in Georgia, I, I, you know, I'd have been lost completely. I went to a, you know, 2A smaller school and it fit where the level was really good, but obviously it's not the big, you know, public high school, that level. And it still allowed me to grow and develop as a player. And I, you know, got recruited, you know, by several schools and ultimately went to the University of Wyoming for four years. Yeah. Now, I got to ask this because obviously I know you um, extremely well, you know, both, you know, from national teams and then obviously coaching you, um, you know, in the BBL. Um, but, you know, did you, where did you develop some of your core skills, you know, because there's no question that fundamentally, you know, you were, there wasn't almost any weakness in your game. Um, and I'm going to come on to your game very quickly <laughs> after when we get into pro basketball. But, you know, where, where was this fundamental package first developed? England, high school, or was it, you know, honed at college in uh, Wyoming? Well, like I said, definitely, you know, it, it was first by, by Joe Forger. There's no doubt about it, you know the fundamentals and kind of learn just how to play the game the right way. I, I, like I said, those six, six months I was with him was huge for me in my development. And then again, I think, again, just lucky going to the right level of high school, my high school coach, Paul Hill, you know, kind of similar to Joe, you know, very fundamental, really, really good high school coach. He was very experienced and, you know, pushed me, allowed me to de develop. So I think that was huge in my early development, just, yeah, like you said, the fundamentals and then understanding really, truly how to play the game the right way. All right. And then so you go to University of Wyoming um, and you have a really, really solid career there. Really great, a great career. You know, talk to me a little bit about that, about the coaching. You know, what was what were some of the things you would you, you were you were experiencing there that have actually right. helped you both as a as a as a professional player, but then also starting to look back now in your role as, a, as an assistant coach? Yeah, I mean, it was I mean, it was definitely a big jump, you know. Wyoming was at the time in, in, in the Western Athletic Conference, you know, kind of mid-major plus, high major minus level. Um, and, you know, and, also, looking, and also a football, a football school that was like, what, top 10 in the nation, if I'm not mistaken, right, it, at that time. Right. They had a big football program. So it was eye-opening. And my head coach was a guy named Joby Wright, who I was in his first recruiting class. He was the head coach at Miami of Ohio. He coached Wally Zerbiak, those kind of four or five years and went to the tournament. But, you know, he had played at Indiana University for Bobby Knight and he was an assistant for Bobby Knight for about 10 years. <laughs> so, you know, and obviously I'm older and we're in that age, you know, that those years, you know, is the mid nineties where coaching styles are very different than today. <laughs> so it was, you know, it was, that was eye opening. His, his coaching style, again, very demanding. And, you know, he's a, on, on, you know, the Bobby Knight, tree disciple and very strict very demanding and it was tough you know it was tough i'd never experienced coaching like that so you um, actually so he was actually you know pretty much all all bobby knight kind of philosophy as well you know yeah. so you no, know we stance very, and you know all the yeah. defensive stuff you know that's awesome well, to know that because well, that, that is that's well, a direct well, yeah, exactly. to, to that stuff now admittedly the the game has changed and but but still some of his principles still hold to the, you know, today. Yeah. And obviously his motion offensive rules sort of still. Most well, I was going to come to that. That's what we ran that motion offense, the Indiana motion offense, where it was a quick entry, you know, to, to get the ball in and then we're playing motion. So, you know, very, and I like that style, you know, it kind of suited me, uh, you know, being big as a, as a screener. And, you know, I always think looking back again, because of, 
my basketball education with Joe Forber, my high school coach. I, I actually think I, you know, and obviously people might not agree with this, but I always thought I had pretty good X's and O's, like a basketball really? brain. I knew how to, awesome. to play the game. So that motion offense really fitted my style, being a screener, and I could make reads out of it and, 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 and go from there, not just being a robot and running set after set after set, if that makes sure. sense. It yeah, kind of fitted awesome. how I kind of thought about the game. Um, but very intense, very detailed orientated, you know, mistakes weren't really tolerated, you know, but, uh, but it was eye opening that first year, my freshman year, you know, I really was looking back, I probably should have redshirted, you know, I don't know if I was ready for that level, because I mean, the league was really good, you know, in terms of Utah, BYU, New Mexico, I mean, powerhouses, San Diego State, uh, really good league, you know, um, so I, you know, and I, I, I've said this before in other interviews, you know, I, I played with Theo Ratliff for two years, cool. you know, as an NBA All-Star. Um, and that first year, you know, the first six months, it literally, I couldn't get a shot off, you know, because I was a backup five, he was a starting five, and playing against him every day was a nightmare. But I think that helped, again, my development, you know, and we all, you know, we both know I wasn't the greatest athlete at all. So I had to figure out ways to play against long athletic bigs. So that, I think that helped my, my, my development. And then thankfully my second year, my sophomore year, I started and Theo played at the four. So my life was a lot easier. <laughs> like, okay. But awesome. it was that old school mentality of I'm a five, be a five, be on the block. You're playing, you know, eight feet and in, screen, roll, get big, you know, and, 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 and be a, uh, you know, physical presence on, on, on both ends of the floor. So, uh, you know, but, but, but that was the mentality at that. Of, of you know, course, at that time. a thousand percent. Um, just, just aside, but were you in practice, like outside of practice, talking about, I'm talking about when you're just getting shots up, were you starting to develop your shooting at that moment or were you like, just shooting elbow jump shots, you know, like 2000? Elbow shooting? jumpers, <laughs> elbow jumpers, maybe a short corner jumper, but it was like, literally, if I took an elbow jumper in a game, if I miss it, I'm done. You know, it's like, no, no more. But it, but again, that was just a different mentality of the college game back then. Yeah. Um, actually, at Utah, during that time, um, Keith Van Horn was kind of in the same four years as me, and he was one of the first skill bigs yeah. that had that freedom yeah. to shoot outside, to handle it, to, you know, pass on the perimeter and things of that sort. But that was kind of Rick Majerus's philosophy so, and his so. style, whereas... You know, Coach Wright, it was very more kind of old school. So how it how, it, you know, how crazy, it how crazy it was it is, and I'm sure well, I'm gonna to talk to you about this in the pro scenario now. But um, you know, if we if if you were both recruited at this moment, um, you know, in, in this day and age, you would have been the stretch five and Theo would be underneath yeah. the basket, you know, and exactly you, it would have been you'd be just you know different. You'd be shooting like you know six six threes a game, you know, and, and with really good you know percentages. So it's absolutely crazy. You know, yeah, to think that. absolutely. So and I could always shoot, but literally, you know, in terms of our workouts, skill development workouts, it was always everything was on the block. Everything was on the block, and again, maybe a elbow jumper. It was never any skill work on on the perimeter. Right. So that's great. Um, you know, it's so, just that was that was my mindset. So you finished at Wyoming, um, yep. and then your first pro job. You can talk about you know how it happened and who you know who you went to play for. Yeah. So you know, coming out, I was lucky because I think I'm not sure if it was the, that spring when I came out, or it was the the kind of spring summer before that in terms of the Bosman ruling, which changed everything. Obviously, changed the landscape of European basketball at that time. And so I got lucky, obviously, with my passport, you know, being a, a, a definite positive for me. Um, but my senior year, I kind of, you know, I injured my knee. I had surgery and I only played about 10, 12 games my senior year. It was never quite right. So, I, you know, I, I got healthy that spring and that summer. <clears throat> and then I, you know, ended up having really, if what I remember, you know, an offer to play for the Bir Birmingham Bullets with Mike Finger and obviously Harry Robleski. And then I had an offer for a, a team in Austria. And it was basically the same money, same money. There wasn't a big difference in it. And obviously at the time, and, and a big, big thing was 
that that first summer I went with with Laszlo to England camp in that summer and um, uh, pl played uh, played for him and Nick Nurse was the assistant coach sure. so then obviously he just got done at Birmingham knew Harry we talked about Harry the setup obviously you know you've got Tony Dorsey and Nigel Lloyd and the potential and you know, that conversation in the summer at, at, at England camp really helped. I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the Birmingham Bullets and, and ended up playing there my first year. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, so now you're coaching, you're, you're, you're getting coached by Mike Fingo. You Finger. know, what was what was your, uh, you know, things that you took away? Because I think he was more of a, a pro coach, you know, someone, yes. uh, you know, demanding, but also, you know, allowed those players to, you know, perform. and a bit, you know, Yeah, exactly. A bit more freedom position. to play. It's a different mentality than, than college coaching, that pro coaching. And and actually, Laszlo really helped that that you know, two, two weeks of, of England camp in the summer because he was that way, you know, play, play free. Yes, he had obviously structure and things, but when we talk about me being able to shoot, I still remember, and I've said it before, I remember getting chewed out by Laszlo when I'd be open on the three-point line with, you know, in practice or games there, and I didn't shoot it because I wasn't wired that way after four years at Wyoming. Yeah. And he chewed me out. If you're open, shoot the ball. If you're not going to shoot it, I'm not going to play you. you. You know, you can shoot it, so shoot. So that started, that freedom was huge for me. You know, that that belief, you know, and, and that way of thinking. And then going to play for, you know, Mike Finger at Birmingham. Again, obviously, veteran team with Nigel, with Tony, Reggie Kirk, you know, Clive Allen, Tony Sims. You know, pro style, you know, obviously with veterans, much more freedom and 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 that was a great learning experience as well and obviously playing with those guys fab as well fab uh you know really really helped help me develop that year as a, as a rookie so um coming from the, the the laszlo training camp did you start you know shooting the ball from 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 distance yes. and stuff you know so, and so that was it once i got done with gb camp then workouts and 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 you know practices you know it was shoot, 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 you know, try and develop that three point shot, obviously a different dimension to my game. And obviously in Europe, you know, obviously spacing, you know, is a premium, how the bigs played in Europe at that time. I had to think, OK, I've got to, you know, add that dimension to my game to have a career. And, and obviously, if I couldn't shoot, I was going to be stuck to what level I could play at. Sure. So. You know, that's just, a yeah. that's an interesting concept, though, because we're still talking about, um, you know, the early 2000s. You know, I I've often just thought um, if you played now and I'm sure you think about this all the time. I mean, really, what level could you get to? I mean, you would be a bona fide, you know, like at least at Euro League, Euro Cup level, because your skill set was like you could, you could, you know, really punish the small inside guys if someone puts, they put someone small on you, you know, but you could shoot it to all your most unlimited range with a consistency. Plus you screened and defended in so many ways. I mean, this is what the prototype five stretch five is at this yeah, day. Now, it, it, it's crazy to think about it. I mean, I don't know if I'd have got to, you know, your league level or that level, but you know, yeah, I, I, I think just the, the style of play today, yes, I, I, you know, would have suited me more. And Chris, yeah, like, probably, probably. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, it's not as crazy as it sounds. You're going to laugh. I'm going to make all the, the people laugh. But it's not a stretch to talk about, you know, the, the Joker, you know, Jokic, because you <laughs> right. had a skill set with the ability to pass the ball you know, and, and really understand the game, you know, link people up, you know, that's what I used to say to people, but this was way before you, you played in an era that when you shot the ball from outside, people were still at times upset, you know, why are you shooting the ball from outside? There were times I was upset and say, you know, why are yeah. you not like pounding this little guy on the, on the block? And, and, and these, right. you know, the way the game has changed, I mean, it's, it's, it's so different. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree. I agree. I mean, I, you know, that was my game. I mean, don't get me wrong. I still like the physical side of things, you know, down low and that physical contact. Obviously, I wasn't just standing around shooting threes, no, 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 but no. that definitely that definitely was a, 
uh, an extra dimension to my game of drawing a, a five man out, you know, to create space for others. And like you said, linking up play on the perimeter. So from Birmingham, um, the next moves and uh, who was coaching those teams? So I went that summer, that actually right when I got done with Birmingham Bullets, I actually went to, out to John Amici's uh, house in, in Phoenix, in Arizona, and worked out with him for about three weeks. I mean, it might have been a month because obviously he was, you know, getting into, in, into the NBA at that stage and he was working out and, you know, he said, come out, work out, you know, play open gym at his workout facility. There's a bunch of pros. I went there and that, again, really helped just, I was still a young big. And I ended up playing in the big Nike Treviso camp at Treviso that summer, you know, a big showcase camp in Europe. So, you know, that three weeks a month uh, uh, with John working out with him and those guys there really prepared me. And I had a really good camp. I made the all-star team, um, did really well that, that five days there. And from there, I ended up getting a contract offer to go to Greece in A1 at Apollon Patra, um, which again, huge jump going from the BBL to, 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 to Greece, A1. And, and, and it was, a, you know, a, a smaller team, you know, middle of the pack. If they made the playoffs, they were happy. Um, but again, another big jump in, in, in level and in, in coaching and style of play, um, you know, played with some really good players and, you know, those Panathinaikos, Olympiakos, Ike, Iris at the time were, were stacked with high level, high level players. So that was a, a, a great experience for me. And, you know, the coaching, you know, going to Greece now, that's another completely change, you know, in, in coaching, you know, <laughs> and also metho metho methodology as well, you know, just the, yeah, how very, they build up the two a days, you know, how they're, yeah. they're preparing for teams. Yeah, different level of professionalism. You know, obviously Birmingham was great, but whole different level. Um, you know, two a days, three a days, the preseason preparation, going away for a month in the mountains, uh, the physical preparation. I mean, whole whole another level of how to be a pro, what a professional is. Sure. And very structured, very structured, you know, very different to, to Mike Finger. You know, it was it was it was very, very structured, a lot of sets. And, and he, you know, the coach there, very controlling what, what he wanted. So again, a different style, style of play. Um, you know, the team, we did okay. We didn't make the playoffs, uh, you know, had a, had, a, had a decent year. But again, just being coached a different way with that structure, uh, a different level of thinking about X of no tactics. You know, again, very detail or, or orientated and again, eye-opening that sure. that level of thought of how to how to play the game and in these years subsequent from before the bullets uh, are you are you on the national team is laszlo coaching you still yeah yeah um, so i'm playing on the, on the england england team at that point still with still with laszlo um so yes you know doing both that's awesome. I mean, obviously, just very quickly talking about um, him, you know, uh, Coach Laszlo, who's, you know, a legend and someone that um, anyone that, you know, has worked with him and touched, you know, um, you know, just understands the level that he was coaching at and some of the things he did at a time which were, you know, in some ways revolutionary to the game as well, yeah. you know, just did, yeah, you did how he prepared the team. Um, yeah, absolutely. I don't, uh, you know, he was great to play for. Absolutely a player's coach and, and, and really took care of us. You know, obviously the struggles with England basketball at the time. And we had talent. You know, there was a lot of talent at that time. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think he got the best out of, out of us because obviously our preparation was limited. But he was, he was an unbelievable coach to play for. Right. Uh, going from uh, Greece, you went next to, am I right in saying Italy, you went to? No, I went to Belgium. Belgium, sorry, I went, yeah. I went, went to Belgium. I went, it was two years, or actually a year, uh, holy, um, I went to Pepinster in, in, in Belgium, uh, played there um, and played for a Croatian coach, Nick Sabavcevic. <laughs> so again, here, another big experience, my first experience playing with, uh, you know, Croatian, Serbian, Yugoslav, Bosnia, you know, sure, that, sure, that, yeah. and that school. Again, very, very demanding, high level, yeah. but an unbelievable tactician, unbelievable tactician. Um, you know, 
again, it was two a days, three a days. I mean, nonstop. I mean, that two years probably did maybe take a couple of years off my career, honestly. Well, am so, I am I not mistaken? And you can answer this question if you let us see what type of because they they all followed some set some semblance of the same um, coaching methodology at that, that time. Mm-hmm. But um, did you go contact on the day of the game at the shoot arounds? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That hour in the shoot around, there was always a 20, you know, 20 minute portion. We're playing five on five. It's, you know, all, when, we, when we do the walkthrough or I mean, it's not a walkthrough, but what should have been a walkthrough for a lot of other teams, we played, we played, you know, went well, through the scout, we, we played, we were taped. And it was full go. It's unbelievable. Roger Roger Huggins uh, uh, told told me that story that uh, he you know they went to play the cup final. Cup final was eight pm at night, and um, he had a Serbian coach, and they were full contact for like forty five mm-hmm. minutes on the morning of the game. I mean, yep. some players now would walk out the gym in this <laughs> in this day and age. <laughs> even if the, I had players last year that would just laugh at me even on a Friday to say, hey, are we taping on a Friday before the game on Saturday? And like, right. yeah. You, right. and, you, know, it's, you know, and it was, I mean, literally the whole season, the whole eight months, nine months, it was full go. I mean, very, very rare that morning workout, you know, of, of, of weights, of skill work, I mean, it was full go the whole nine months. You know, like you said, full contact the day of the game. I remember in in, in preseason, we went away to camp. We had we had three a days for three weeks, for three a days, uh, and it was just. But that's their, like you said, methodology. That's the the umbrella coaching umbrella that you know those those you know uh, Yugoslav coaches come from. Yeah. That's a great point. Uh, and then from, so two, two, two really good years in a really solid, you know, European league. Yeah, the league was um, really good. You really know, good. The league you know? was really good in Belgium. There's a lot of English lads, you know, Roger Huggins, Mark Hawley, Andy Gardner, Silas Chung. You know, a lot of English lads were, were over in that league, but it was a re- really good league at the time. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I ended up in Germany in the Bundesliga. Um, right. And so, did you play one season there? Yeah, I actually, it was kind of three quarters of a season. I ended up going from Belgium to there. Um, offer came in, the team did the deal, and I ended up going out to NBC Weissenfels. It was over kind of in the east part of, of Germany in the Bundesliga and, and uh, played for a Bosnian coach. And, uh, you know, obviously the Bundesliga was great. It was really good. And that kind of fit, you know, my style of play that, you know, it was a physical league. Yeah but still skilled in terms of the bigs. And uh, yeah, actually, I, I played actually pretty well. I, I played well in the Bundesliga for, for that team. I had a really, arguably, maybe that the, the best season there of, of, of my pro career. Right. And then to Italy after that. Yeah, so, so then went to Italy for three years. Uh, my first year I was in Messina um, and, and, you know, played, you know, for a, for a coach, Matteo Bonaccioli, um, who arguably, you know, with you would be the two biggest coaching influences on my career, you know, and, and, and coaching career. Uh, fantastic coach. Uh, was lucky enough, I played for my third year in Italy at Teramo, and he's a head coach at Udine right now. But, sure. I mean, he was head coach at Bologna. You know, he's he was a really, had a really high career. level coach, yeah. High level coach, high level coach. Um, but, you know, playing in Italy and in Syria, unbelievable experience. And, you know, obviously, I, now this is, you're in your real professional career, you know, like yeah. this is this is the main part of your career. But are you starting to think a little bit about coaching at that time? Or are you thinking, are you, start, you know, but you, or, or you just keep soaking all of this stuff in um, from, a, from a basketball perspective? Yeah, I think because at that stage that, uh, you know, I think it, in terms of me thinking about coaching as a career after basketball, it started playing for Nick Sabasovic in Belgium because of his, you know, like I said, his tactics, his X's, X's and O's. I, I really, really enjoyed that. I, you know, so like I said, soaked that up. And then playing for Coach Bonaccioli in Italy and obviously that level of play, that level of coaching, professionalism, I think those kind of four years right there really started you know, me on my path to, I want to coach, 
this is what I want, you know, to, to have a career at coaching once I get done playing. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah. And then after Italy, you, you come back to, to the UK. Um, I played to you for about yeah. three months. Yep, for, that's, that's right. Yeah, the less said about that, the better. That that's always that one of those jobs that I erase from my mind. Um, yeah, and then you then you end up. At, I don't know. Went back to the Czech Republic. That's right. I uh, went to the Czech Republic, and then at that stage, after that year, uh, what was I? I was thirty three at that time. Right. So I'm starting obviously on the down slope. Uh, you know, legs are starting to go, knees are starting to go. And obviously the opportunity at Everton Tigers came uh, with Henry Mooney initially um, that at that stage of my career, obviously being close, you know, Southport's only 20 minutes away from Liverpool. I could come back, live at home, be around my family. I had a young daughter at the time and it just worked out perfectly. And you know, that, that first few years of, of the Tigers, obviously with the support of the football club, yeah. financially, it was it was very sound. So I, I came back and, and, and played there. Now, I, I, you know, I, I want to really start getting into to, to you as the coach, uh, because you have talked a lot about the stuff we just talked about um, on other podcasts and stuff. But, um, you know, you, you when I took over the Tigers, um, you know, straight away, I think on one of our first meetings, you had said, look, you know, I, um, I you know, I want to pay, play for as many years as possible, but, you know, I'm starting to see, you know, I'd really right. like to get involved with the coaching and you made a conscious effort to talk to me as a player, but also with a coach's hat on, you know, so, Hey, I think, you know, we could, de you know, defend this action like this, or, you know, have you seen this type of, you know, something like this we could use and you had so much experience we, you know was that what was going in your mind you know going along in your well, mind at that time right exactly and especially that you know when you that second year when you became coach uh, again I know my career's only got you know two three years left you know at that point and you know really starting to take that transition seriously and I know obviously we had that conversation and you know you were great with me in terms of hey we're talking about or we, you know, whatever X's knows this ball screen coverage, this, or they do, you know, the opponent does this. So shall we do this? And, you know, open discussions, but you also allowed me, you know, to break down film. I know, remember at the time you, you know, I asked if I could do it and we had a conversation and it was to go watch film and kind of start breaking some things down. And then we talked about it with coach, you know, Diego um, and, and that process really, I think accelerated you know, going from that players, you know, sure. mode to coaching mode. Yeah. And that was those two years. And it, you know, was, was, was phenomenal for me. And then also what you, you know, you allowed me uh, and the club allowed me to then start coaching the academy that was started. Okay. Yeah. You, you know, and that was a big thing, you know, getting my feet wet there. And I mean, that really triggered the, the, you know, going from player to coach. Right. Okay. So now, you know, you come to the end of your career, um, you know, thankfully we, we had a great fight away into that, to that, yeah. to that season. Um, when, what was your mindset there? You, you know, you had talked about going back to America um, mm -hmm. and you wanted to get involved in college coaching first, before I, you talk about that process um, just very quickly kind of encapsulate, what at that stage you felt your kind of coaching philosophy would have been? I mean, that's a, such an overused word we use, but you know, what would, what would you be pinning yourself to, you know, as a, as a, as a philosophy, both, you know, offensively, defensively, or what were you thinking? Hey, if I start coaching, these are the things that I want to want to concentrate on. Right. And, and obviously, you know, I'm very young at that time as a, sure. as a you know, a coach. And you know, obviously with the academy, I actually thought at that time I wanted to be, you know, quite structured in how you play, kind of controlling tempo sets, trying to, you know, looking back, be way too clever, you know, way too clever with sets and overthinking things completely. Sure. But I, I, I like to, you know, at that time, I, you know, liked the idea or wanted to play with good tempo 
you know, good tempo, you know, in, in, in transition and things, but then in the, in the half court, be quite structured and rigid in, in, and be set, kind of set heavy, sure. you know, to be able to, at that time, oh, I'm going to control things, you know? Um, and defensively, it was, it was quite, you know, uh, to kind of get up and pressure and be in the passing lanes, uh, you know, and pick up full court and, and, and get after teams, you know, back then was, was kind of the, the, the path I wanted to go down. Right. Okay. Great stuff. And so now you come from the UK. I mean, you've got this huge um, bank of experience as a player with all of these, I mean, world-class coaches. Let's just knock some of those, you know, you, you, you had all your college coaches, you had all the international coaches, and then you played for Nick Nurse, Chris Finch, <laughs> and Laszlo Nemeth. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. it's a pretty you know, storied kind of um, group of coaches there that, you know, you gain all this experience. Yeah, I mean, yeah, looking back, I mean, they're just very lucky, right? Place at the right time, you know, to have, I mean, like I said, if it was just Laszlo, Nick Nurse, and Chris Finch, I mean, that's unbelievable. Oh, you know, man. so lucky that not many players get to be around and be taught and be coached by, you know, those level of coaches. Yeah, definitely. And so now you 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 make this transition. Talk about that first um, coaching job, and you know, also just very very quickly encapsulate what that process was. How did you actually um, go about it, and and how hard would it be for you know someone, a British person, to be able to do that pro to to get that process done? Right. Um, I mean, it was, it was definitely not an easy process. Like I said, you know, my last year was my last year. I knew my last year of playing was going to be my last year of playing. And, you know, my wife being from, you know, a, a, a America, I met her at university at Wyoming. It was always, we'll go, we'll go back to the States when I'm done playing. Um, so obviously then it was okay to get into college coaching, get my foot in the door. So that last year, um, just, you know, again, contacts in the States, um, you know, looking at job openings online, I, you know, called, called people I knew, Hey, do you know, any jobs openings, you know, this coach, do you know, that coach to just get my foot in the door somewhere. And I probably applied to 50, 60, you know, jobs of all levels, D1, D2, junior college, NAIA. It was just get an opportunity. And, and literally, I mean, it's difficult because I was still in England. I, you know, I had some contacts, but not not great at that point because obviously I was still playing um, and, and and it came down to I had three assistant coaching uh, uh, opportunities or offers at the junior college level um, at, at Laramie County which is in Cheyenne Wyoming which was a part-time position it was like seven thousand dollars part-time position Central Wyoming which uh, junior college uh, and I had to would have had to have been assistant coach, but also been dorm director. <laughs> and again, it was, I mean, money wasn't great at all. And then Lamar, which is a community college in the, you know, Southeast corner of Colorado in the middle of nowhere. And it turned out that because in the summers, I would, we, uh, me and my wife, my family would go back to Laramie so she could see her family, but I would work out at the university still right. and stay in shape and work out with the players you know, they were kind enough to let me do that. Well, I, I became very close with one of the assistant coaches, Sean Vandever, who knew the head coach at Lamar very well. And it was through that connection that, you know, I got the interview, went through that process and, and, and got the job at Lamar. Right. And um, so you did uh, two seasons at Lamar or what? Just I did three. three. No, I did three years there. Three years I there. did three years there. Yeah. there at Lamar in the mid middle of nowhere. And, and, and that was a big transition you know in terms of junior college basketball and what that entails right and so at that college are you um are you doing a lot of uh, on court or is it you starting this what is basically you know 50 50 or maybe you're going to give me a different percentage of um college coaching which is recruiting you know what's the what's what were you what were you starting to get into that recruiting and on the road scenario um but still being on the floor what what was what was your role in yeah, those yeah it was everything like literally everything it was 
absolutely recruiting you know recruiting is as in college at any level is the lifeblood of of the program so jumped into recruiting did a lot of the encore especially skill work you know uh skill workouts where you know the lads would come in between classes after classes and and by position did a lot of skill work uh, and even in, in practice yes the head coach you know, was, was the dominant voice in practice, but he was great in terms of letting me have a voice and, 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 and taking drills and things of that sort. But it was at the junior college level as an assistant coach. I mean, it's, you're doing everything. I mean, yeah. it's great training. I mean, in yeah. terms of like literally driving the bus to games, doing the laundry, yeah. uh, recruiting class checks, taking study hall. I mean, it, it was a great education because you had to do everything. And, yeah. and learn everything. So it was a great learning curve to prepare me to ultimately where I am now. Yeah. So you now go to, um, after three years, you go to Montana State, um, you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, a mid-major um, college mm -hmm. or, you know, low to mid-major, mm -hmm. um, getting up there. What, um, you know, talk to me about your role. And I, I mean, we see the glory so we see the tournament games and all these TV games. Um, but talk to me about, you know, what the, you know, what your role is and, you know, especially with the, the recruiting aspect and, and how much you've had to really put in the effort there. Yeah. I mean, initially when I, when I came in, when I got the job and, and I've been here obviously eight years now and I've, you know, I'm playing or working for my third coach here. You know, I've been very lucky to, to, stay here um you know as new coaches have come in and the kind of evolution of, of, of the program but you know initially obviously what got me in the door was uh, you know was being able to recruit internationally and and obviously particularly in europe and bringing a a a different kind of recruiting market to the program here obviously mm -hmm. that was my niche that was something different out that i would bring and i i, I get that so being able to, to, you know, initially recruit, it was all about recruiting into, obviously in the US as well, but, you know, getting that one or two, you know, international recruits to Montana State to be, you know, difference makers for the program. So that was a, a big thing my first year here, uh, kind of maybe more so than on, on the court coaching. Yes, I you know, was the position coach for the bigs and, and obviously did a lot of skill work with the bigs, but it was a big focus on, on recruiting initially. Right. And now, you know, what, what, how would you say that your role has evolved over time? You know, now what does, what does your, like on a typical, you know, week in the middle of the season, you know, how does it, how does your role look? Yeah. I mean, obviously recruiting is recruiting and it never stops. That's still, you know, kind of the number one role absolutely um but it's you know a lot of it is um you know in practice you know with with our head coach of of you know practice design what we're focusing on our plan for the next two three four weeks down the road wow. you know in terms of uh, you know where what we're starting at where we're going to get to what you know things we need to focus on um, you know, scouting, scout reports, you know, getting ready, you know, to, to, to play, you know, um, in terms of not just the video scout, the paper scout, you know, all that preparation. Um, and then, you know, basically kind of looking after our program, our guys to take certain things off the plate of my head coach. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, he, he's been great. Coach Sprinkle I'm working for right now is, you know, you've got to think and act like a head coach, that's you know, because awesome. his awesome. job is to prepare me too. you know, that's my goal. Ultimate goal is to, to become a head coach. But, you know, in the two years I've worked for him, he was very different from the two other coaches I worked for, you know, from day one, it was, you've got to think and act like a head coach now, you know, and I trust you, you know, and I've got to help you prepare for you to be sitting in the big seat. And it's right. been great. It's, it, it's, it's been great, you know, in terms of even, you know, with the boosters and the supporters and, and dealing with administration and those side of things that people don't think about in terms of college coaching as well, that plays such a, you know, a big part. 
Well, I think uh, just two things on on the, what you've just talked about there. The first is, um, you know, uh, people don't really fully understand when you get to, you know, professional head coaching and, you know, being in, you know, high level college programs, that there is a, a huge amount of stuff that's off the court that you yeah. have to be able to deal with. You have to be able to deal with media. You have to deal with your ancillary staff that are really important now strength and conditioning you know mm -hmm. whoever else you've got you know medical staff you've got to be able to have a great relationship with them you know in college you've got to be, have a great relationship like you said with the boosters with the um, ad with p potentially mm -hmm. other types of educational type people a like professional basketball it's you know gm president you know owner those right. type of uh, relationships mm -hmm. so um, these are great things what I was going to say to you, though, uh, it's great to hear that you're doing that um, and learning these things, but also from a from a pure basketball perspective. And I actually one of the things I used to do when I used to work for both Flaslo and say Chris Finch, um, you know, was I used to sit there thinking, what would I do as the head coach? You know, now right. it wouldn't be me making that decision, but there were times and like you've heard, probably heard this story before when I, when I, you know, there were many times I go into, you know, a half time meeting and I'd have all these things written on my, on my, my little pad. And I'd just be waiting for Chris not to say one yeah. of them. Um, Chris Finch and he'd say all of them and I'd just have to say he'd ask you know have you got anything to say and I'd have to say no you know there would be one or right. two times right. where I could actually say something but um, it's great that you're starting to have that mindset uh, you know mm -hmm. about being a head coach because it is completely different than, mm -hmm. than being a being an assistant coach there's there's no doubt about that so that's great yeah stuff. absolutely and I'm like I said I'm lucky that you know because not all head coaches are the same that you know coach Sprinkle is allowing me to develop and have more of a voice and, 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 and again, to help prepare me when the time comes that I'm prepared to be a head coach and then have success as a, as a head coach. That's two different things. So, you know, and, and you, I've got to put myself out there to, you know, in all those different pieces of the pie, you know, to, you know, and again, it's getting out of your comfort zone and there are some things that I'm not great at. Um, but I've got to, you know, if, if, Hey, if I want to be a head coach one day, you know, I've got to do this right and do this well. And, and it's, it's, it's just a learning process every day. Yeah, that's great. Um, talk to me, though, a little bit qu about, uh, quickly about what, how your coaching philosophy now is starting to change and evolve. Now you're, you're on cutting edge, um, you know, high level basketball day in, day out. I love the fact that you're as a staff being able to talk about practices and I'm assuming about other tactics and stuff. Talk to me about what's changed from that player that left, you know, professional basketball, had all that experience and now, you know, is just thinking, you know, is talking about just, just coaching. Yeah, well, I think now, you know, obviously through this last, what, 10, 11 years, I go a little bit to the other spectrum. You know, when I said, oh, initially, um, I want to control things, be set heavy. I'm now a bit more kind of less is more. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think, going back to kind of knowing how to play, you know, and especially in today's game with, with where it's kind of more small ball, spacing, different mentality. But I think it's more concepts, concepts rather than sets, you know, spacing, cutting, ball movement, uh, you know, players playing with some 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 freedom um, and allowing players to kind of play a little bit more, um, you know, and, and that's where my mind goes to. Um, you know, I, I don't want to control. I want to, uh, again, it's the philosophy of teaching your players how to play. And then, yes, there's going to be obviously some structure and some rules and things that you're looking for, but allowing them to play, you know, know how to play, good IQ, good feel, Again, don't be robots, play the game kind of thing, if that makes sense. Interesting. You know, you know and I'm, I'm, I've actually gone more to, you know, kind of a pack line, you know, philosophy defensively, kind of being right. in the gaps, hard hand and foot stunts, you know, rather than being up and at them, sure. kind of packing the paint, um, you know, contested twos are going, you know, you've got to beat us with contested twos, no layups, no open threes. 
but uh, so uh, that's a great this great stuff you know uh, and i'm very interested about you know pack line versus you know no middle and um who's running you know who's got some hybrid stuff out of that what um if you say your pack line because you know um i actually coached uh, daniel chefu last year who played at villanova and you know mainly mm -hmm. with you know jay wright who's a pack line guy um when you when you're collapsing and taking away the pain um you, you what's the philosophy then to get back out to the three-point shooters if you know if you're really taking away a lot of kind of driving lanes and stuff um is it is it you've got to wall quickly and be big um, to make the passes tougher so that you can get out on the rotation? Or yeah, the I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, obviously, the first thing is, you know, we spend a lot of time on on, on closeouts, you know, being on balance and, and no direct blow buys because it's hard to play pack line if you're just getting direct blow buys. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, so we spend a lot of time of, of closeouts, closeouts, angles, you know, you know, being on balance, hand placement, and then we call it power slides, you know, obviously laterally to, you know, stay between the ball and the rim. You know, no no direct blow buys is big for us. And then, you know, being in, in, in the gaps, you know, obviously whoever's got the ball, you have your defender and they've got to see the two guys in the gaps on either side, you know. Um, and then it's hand and foot stunt. And then again, close out. And then, you know, it might be a help the helper with another hand and foot stunt. Sure. And hand placement, hand placement, you know, tips, steals, deflections, that there's no direct, you know, passing lanes, hopefully. And obviously it's a little bit scout specific if, you know, it's going to a, you know, a Absolutely, down to three, yeah. level, you know, Touch. maybe it's not a high level elite shooter, you know, you can hand them foot stunt a little longer to take away the, the penetration. Or if it's an elite shooter, it's a quick hand and foot stunt, and then you've got to be there on the catch. You know, I mean, that's a... Hand. That's that's a great stuff. I mean, that's really great stuff, coach. You know, the 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 um the the closeout stuff. I mean, it's so important in this day and age because you know at this moment, you know, so many people are really struggling to stay in front of the ball, and the ball handlers yes. are incredible at this moment. And the refereeing is you know really hurting how the defenders doing it. But you know, especially at college level, I think you probably right. can get a little bit more done than you can at the pro the pro level the way the way it is at this moment. So right. But, it, but that's it. You know, the big thing is for us is not to always have to get in scramble situations. Right. You know, so closing out, keeping the ball in front of you. You know, yes, we, you know, on the wings, you know, free throw line and extended or the 45, whatever you want to talk it. We're kind of squared up, but nose on the top shoulder. We're not going to give you baseline, but it's definitely no middle. And we're going to kind of influence to the baseline. And then obviously, we, you know, consistent rotations. But Big thing is no direct blow buys, you know, right. and not having to always be in scramble situations. And um, ball screen defense very quickly. Um, what's the main philosophy with, with regards to ball, you know, middle ball screen? Yeah. On, on the, side. yeah. Yeah. Well, on the out, outer thirds, on the outer thirds, we ice or down, right. you know, whatever the terminology, black, whatever the terminology is, but ice, ice you know, the, the guard jumps on the top shoulder, the bigs on the baseline. Uh, so there's definitely no middle and influence right, you know, right to the short corner or corner. And in the middle third, it's a little, again, scout specific, but we're, you know, we are a uh, kind of, we call it flat show. So the yeah. bigs at the point of the screen, flat, and it will depend again on, on the guard coming off, whether the guard goes over the screen or maybe he goes under the screen, you know, a bit scout specific on that. You know, ideally we could we weak, so send the guard to the weak hand. Okay. Weak hand Interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, is, is is what we you know always look to do. Um, right. Interesting. And then the big be at the point of the screen and obviously stay between the ball and the rim. And if they shoot a free throw line, ten foot pull up that can kind of be contested, that's the shot that you know we're going to give up. And just real quickly on that, um, is that uh, almost all scout led? Or is it um, big, you know, can always call, you know, change the defense, you know, or is it mostly, mostly coming from, from the coaching staff? Right. On the, I mean, on the outer thirds, we black. I mean, right. that's it. Sometimes on a, because obviously it's difficult sometimes on a throw and chase. So if the five or the bigs on the, you know, on the three point line at the top of the key and he's going to throw and chase into a screen, it can be more difficult to get into a, 
ice situation. Sure, sure. So a big has the freedom, you know, if he's late can, can change the call, right. you know, the green call, but you know, in the middle third, it's, it's pretty, pretty set flat show. And, and again, and is he, strong. is he, is he shouting weak, weak, weak? Um, yes, from he when, when, he, when, when, the, yes. when the bit, yeah, when that the communication dribbler is piece, zigzag, right. Yeah. From our bigs is huge. And we work on that a lot, that communication from, from the bigs early, loud, continuous, you know, on that communication on the ball screen D. Chris, just two seconds. Let me just put, turn the light on very quickly. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I'm going to let my dog out right quick. Hold on. Yeah, all good. We'll 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 we'll, kill, we'll we'll knock this out this little bit yeah. uh, these last okay. ten minutes, um, coach. What what do you think? Um, I did touch on it. What do you think are the important points for younger British coaches who want to coach in the USA? Um, high school potentially, and then on to junior college or college. Yes, um, I know we talked a little bit about you know before we started. Um, you know, and it's it's funny now. I'm in it. It's it's a whole nother kind of world. Obviously, when I when I first applied, I was like, oh, I'm a big man coach. I've got 15 years pro experience. It's going to be easy to get a job. And it's really at the at the college level, recruiting is everything. Recruiting is everything. And it's what what players you can get to a program. What players can you bring to the program is the biggest, arguably the biggest thing. Absolutely. It's who you know, relationships are huge. And what recruiting, what, what can you bring different to the table to, 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 as a head coach to my program, what players can you bring differently than what we have right now? I wonder if like just look, say take me for example when you know i was there you know with joe uh, you know at the london task junior programs in those days if i had been a, if i had said to you know to some of those colleges look you know you can have all of babalola but you got to take me instead as with you and I, i'm just wondering how far i'd have got back in those days with with the you know the conveyor belt of players that we had oh. Uh, of course, and that's absolutely, you would have had a job. I mean, you look at it now, you know, I'll, I'll go to example, Oklahoma State, Cade Cunningham, right? <laughs> He's going to be top pick in the draft. Well, his brother was hired as an assistant coach <laughs> at Oklahoma State. Well, he's not being hired for his X's and O's. It's being hired because, so his brother, Cade Cunningham, who's arguably going to be the number one pick in the draft, goes to Oklahoma State. That's it. You look at, you know, assistant coach at USC with the Mobley brothers. The dad is an assistant coach. Yeah. Both brothers are USC. That's, you know, it's not like that all the time, but it's, it's very common. And it, and it goes back to what players can you can, you can get. And obviously I was lucky enough, something different was the international market, you know, and obviously, you know, that's a huge thing right now. It's so common in college athletics, but 11, 12 years ago, it not, not quite as much. No. Um, you know, yes, X's and O's, yes, player development, things of that sort is big, but it's who you know and what kids you can bring to the table. Great, great points. Um, I know how, you know, you've always felt about, you know, British basketball. You've always been, you know, every academy coach in this country, you know, talks, you know, really highly of you and that uh, you're always trying to champion a British player. Hmm. So, you know, talk to me just a little bit about, like, you know, British coaching, you know, the coaching fraternity and what do you think we should be doing to, you know, still improve as, as a basketball nation, especially from the coaching standpoint? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been very lucky, you know, in terms of my relationships with a lot of, you know, the academy coaches, you know, it, 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 back home, obviously, I have great relationships with, with uh, several coaches because obviously recruiting English guys. So, you know, we have two really talented British kids right now. I mean, uh, Adam U and Jabril Bella, who are fantastic players and, and, and great for us. Um, you know, yes, there's a, obviously a lot of talent in, in, in Britain. Absolutely. We churn out a lot of natural talent. Um, I think that the coaching, especially at the academy level, has really improved in just the, 
like I said, 10 years that I've been coaching and, and recruiting, you know, British players. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's excellent academy coaches, Neil Hopkins, uh, you know, Will at Charmwood, you know, uh, um, Steve, James, Steve, uh, Steve, James, sorry, James, Park and Abbey. Yeah. Yeah. James yeah. at Park and Abbey, you know, Alan Keane, I mean, Nick Drain, I mean, there's a, there's a ton, um, you know, and I think in my time coming back to recruit, you do see the standard of practice is, is dramatically improved, dramatically improved in the years that I've been coming back to recruit. And it's, it's great to see, you know, and obviously there are a lot of British kids playing at the college level of all levels here and having a lot of success, which, which is great. Um, you know, I always go back, you know, when you talk about what could be done better, I, the, 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 the one biggest thing for me is just, uh, you know, as, as British kids in that developmental age of 13, 14 years old to whatever, 16, 17, 18, is just that competitive nature you know, to truly learning how to compete at a high level every day, how hard you have to play, how hard you have to work, you know, the being tough, you know, the toughness level and the winning matters, winning counts. You know, it's not just, oh, we lost. Yeah, I played well, great. Oh, you know, we tried, you know, that it's really got to hurt and that edge, you know, and to play with that chip on their shoulder every day. Uh, you know, and there, you know, a lot of British lads ha do have it, but they're, there have been quite a few who have been super talented who just haven't had the edge. And I don't know whether that's innately in, in you as a kid or that's something that learned, but I do think, you know, the intensity of practice, uh, you know, that level of, you know, work intensity being demanded every day by the, by the coaches, you know, I think is a huge thing. And I think that's something that, that, that can be bettered. You um, saying, you know, that's, a, you know, incredible stuff there. I mean, I'm hoping that a lot of people will listen to that and take that home. But um, are you, do do coaches genuinely seek that information? Obviously, you and you're speaking to some of our coaches here in the UK. You're, you're trying to find out about, the, you know, their best player or, you know, who's the best right. player in they think and asking them these questions. But do they come back to you and say, you know, coach, what, 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 what do you, what do you think really will help my players get to America and be successful there? Is that question being asked enough? Uh, I wouldn't say it's been asked enough. There are some coaches who absolutely, you know, not that I know everything, absolutely not. But, you know, in terms of ask me questions like that, you know, ask about, well, what can they do better? You've been to a practice, what can be better? How, you know, what do I need to do to be a better coach or these drills or what drills do you guys do in these certain situations or what, you know, to, to enhance their practice and also talk about their kids, you know, in terms of the development side, well, what does he need to get better at? Can he be a division one player division two? Is it Juco, you know, prep school, NAIA, you know, um, it's just interesting. You know, there are, sorry, there are coaches that do, do reach out and we talk all the time, but there's a lot of coaches that, that don't, you know, and that's fine. They don't have to, they don't have to, but you know, we're in the coaching fraternity and, you know, I had help, you know, as a player, as a coach. And I think that's a big thing for coaches is to, to help other, other coaches. And, and you're always trying to better yourself. You know, I talk to academy or coaches in, in, in England and I ask questions, you know, I, I know, you know, as an example, like Lloyd Gardner and, and Neil Hopkins, I've called them and said, this ball screen D, what, what do you guys do? Or how do you press? Or, you know, I'm always asking questions because to I, we don't have the answers. No one's perfect. No one's perfect. Just going on this subject though. I mean, I think it's really, there are two aspects to it. That I just really want to finish and close on. But um, the first is um, this competitive, you know, uh, attitude stroke, you know, trying to develop this um, to so that our players have a really good chance of, of succeeding at college. 
it's kind of it's something obviously you know it's part of my dna um right. you know as a coach and also how i coach players and especially with the younger players but you know i i, I wonder if the, our national of our governing body and and also everything that's going down you know talks about um you know well we shouldn't be worried about winning we should be worried about developing the player. You know, I hear that a lot, you know, at, uh, at lots of different levels. And I have always said that developing competitiveness and winning is a skill. Um, it's like durability now in my book is a skill. Um, having a player that can't last a professional season is no good right. to me, no matter how good he is. So I've added that as a you know, as a skill. And I think winning is a skill. People who can win, you know, I just, I take this as an example. Darius Defoe, you know, who, who didn't go to college, you know, played at, you know, in Hackney as at, at a community college, like at the early stages of an academy, has had, you know, this, this incredible 18 year career, you know, mm -hmm. because he, doesn't like to lose and he's competitive if you tell him to do one on oh drills he hates it but if you play him you know put him into three on three or five on five you know he's as competitive as they come so you know what, what what's your thoughts on on that situation there yes player development and skill development is huge but you play to win you play to win ultimately at the end of the day it's results you play to win it's not playing to participate <laughs> You play to win. There's a score. You play to win. And, and that has to be, kids have to learn how to win because it's winning's not easy. It's not easy. Either. Everyone would win. Everyone would be great. Everyone would win, right? But the fact that it's like, oh, it's not about winning. It's about player development. No, you play to win. And these kids, you know, young players, you have to learn what it takes to win, how hard it is to win. And yes, developed their skill, skill set, X's and O's, everything that comes with it. But I, I think, you know, learning to win is a skill and then it's a habit. It's a habit and you have to instill that habit of being, you know, what it takes to win. And I, I, and, and I think maybe that sometimes is the British mentality is, isn't it? It's, oh, do your best, it's fine. You know, oh, you did your best. You didn't, you know, you finished second or whatever it is. It's okay, you did your best. No, you play to win. I want to win. I hate losing. And you've got to have that mindset. And I don't understand, like, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. And, um, you know, may maybe that's just me. And again, I don't know everything. But at that age, those developmental years, it's winning it has got to be learned how important it is. You have to win. Interesting. Really good stuff. Uh, just, just talking about our fraternity, though, uh, reaching out to you. Um, I see, you know, you are coaching, you know, at, you know, this, this high pinnacle, um, world-class basketball. Um, are we, are, are we missing this type of touch that you really, you know, we should be reaching out to you, you know, more for all kinds of stuff, you know, for, you know, for being, you know, uh, for pure coaching for, you know, tactics, X and O's, but also, you know, the whole mechanism of, of college basketball in America, which you have, you know, firsthand experience of at every single level. Um, I mean, I'm here, you know, whoever wants to have a discussion or talk anything to do with the States, you know, I, like I said, I had help coming to the States when I was 17 and started my journey. You know, I feel very lucky to be in the position I'm in and I've, you know, have been able to help numerous kids, you know, get to the States of all levels to have an opportunity, to have an opportunity to experience, you know, the American basketball, like I said, college, high school prep, whatever it is, you know, to kind of give back, give back to the game. But I'm, I'm here, I'm, you know, I'd love to be involved more on, on the kind of British or national side of things. I'd love to be involved, love to be involved at the national level, whatever it is. Um, and ho hopefully one day that, that, that can happen. But like I said, I'm, I'm here, whoever, I don't, doesn't matter. I'm here as a resource, questions, you know, please, please contact me, you know, and I want to learn, you know, and have those discussions to, to, to be a better coach too. Okay, three real quick questions. These are rapid fire. Favorite all-time basketball coach? 
Uh, it would be you and Matteo Bonaccioli, my two favorite coaches. <laughs> okay. Seriously. I'm getting, okay. I really appreciate that. Um, favorite, favorite drill um, that you're running or have run or do run on a regular basis? Uh, I'm a big fan. You know, um, I actually like a lot of kind of three on three and five on five, no dribble drills. You know, if we're talking offensively and yeah. defensively too, too, but learning how to, you know, as, as we all know, a lot of, you know, to get our kids who are pounding the ball into the ground, learning how to play without the ball in their hand. Yeah. I'm a big fan and we do it, you know, pretty much every day here, a section of three on three, no dribble, five on five, no dribble Love it. Uh, and, and, and learning how to play. I, I really like that. Well, that's and, then awesome. I, and then I also, I, we do a, have a rebounding drill called Nick's rebounding that we do here. It's a toughness drill. Um, I actually got it, saw uh, Tim Miles uh, when he was head coach at Colorado State do it. And uh, it's, you know, it's just a four and four, you can do it three and three, four and four, five and five, but it's just a continuous rebounding drill. Uh, you know, the, the defensive three, four or five, however you want to do it, you know, you put the cone in um, and two coaches, you know, the defensive team is on for, we do it for 90 seconds, you know? So if it's five on five, you have the five defensive five, you pass to a player, he shoots it, everyone crashes, box out. You know, whoever gets the rebound gets a point, you outlet to a coach, the next five or three, four come in immediately, you pass to them, shot goes up and it's a continuous rebounding, box nice. out, toughness. I, like I do like it and it, yeah. and it shows character. It shows yeah. character on both sides because you always get the guys who really enjoy the physical side and boxing out and who goes and makes that effort to go to the offensive rebound or do they kind of just look like they do? You know, you get found out very quickly. So I, I really like that drill, um, rebounded. And then the last one I like is the usual kind of end of practice energizer drill. We call it the gator drill, get after that ass. And it's, <laughs> you know, that's the gator and... It starts, we bounce the ball on the floor with two coaches with pads. A guy standing on the free throw line has to go up and kind of get a rebound through contact. He pitches it to a coach on the 45. He gets into help side. There's a drive. You take the charge. You roll another ball. You've got to go jump on it. And then you get the ball back. And then you have to go score through the two assistants with the pads. Awesome. And it's just a toughness, hustle, end of practice, energizer drill that the lads get into and I like that one too. I was I was worried that people are not doing these type of drills anymore. So uh, that's a so, that's a great stuff. That's, you know, old school. I'm sure everyone school. has a version version of it, um, but good but stuff. like that one too. It's always a good one at the end of practice. Okay, and then lastly, uh, go to uh, saying or statement that you're always telling your players. We I have to, we have two. I have two. Preparation is our separation. Oh, Preparation nice. is our separation. Everything that we do, you know, whether it's individually as a team, you know, I like to prepare. That. That's our separator to, to, you know, from other teams to put his position to win. And then the other one is just be tougher for longer. Be tougher for longer. Good. Stuff. I mean, simple. Be tougher for longer. Those are two. So, those oh, are two of the real good ones. Yeah, that's awesome stuff. Coach, listen, you know, we could go on for forever. And yeah. I know that we really cut that early stuff down as, as much as we could as possible. But, you know, I'm pretty certain that, um, you know, very soon, you know, in the, in the future, you're going to be a head coach. And, uh, you know, I, I know from, from my side, you know, I'm very proud of what you're doing and um, the fact that, you know, you're still there at the pinnacle uh, as, as a British coach. We need more, more coaches, um, you know, trying to make that journey. But, you know, I know that you're going to continue to champion that situation. So I just want to thank you for coming on uh, the Time Out uh, podcast. My pleasure, Tony. It's been great. And obviously, I can't thank you enough for the influence that you've had on my career. Seriously. Like, you've been a huge influence. And, and I can't thank you enough.